Ira Cohen, co-founder and chief data scientist at Anadot. Welcome to the Data Exchange Podcast. Hi, how are you, Ben? Uh, so Thank full you. disclosure, I am an advisor to Anadot, although the topic of our conversation today probably won't touch that much on Anadot because this is mostly going to be dealing with uh, what Erin and I uh, are seeing in the space of tools for analysts. So these are people who work with data, um, but may not necessarily be people who write the uh, code or programs. So uh, Ira, so full disclosure, I first started uh, 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 my first experience with uh, BI tools was way back in the day <laughs> when, uh, when uh, actually uh, most of the BI tools went through IT. So the IT person will set up a BI tool and then you would have to write a report. And uh, I, in fact, I remember not exactly getting trained to write the reports, but at least reading the documentation of the BI tool. Um, and then a few years later, I was invited to a meeting to a B VC firm in Sand Hill Road. And it turned out to be... Uh, just to kind of uh, get acquainted with or, or get a briefing on uh, what ended up being Tableau. And so <laughs> I, was super, I was super excited actually, because basically to me, it kind of looked familiar right away as someone who was using uh, S and S plus, because uh, they mm -hmm. had this notion of, uh, of pivoting using charts. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so when I first started, actually you, there were no BI tools that you installed directly as an analyst. You had to go through IT. Yeah, I guess uh, BI was mainly around, um, I mean, you had to be a database person to know how to run, how to actually execute these reports. Yeah, yeah, there was, a, to... was going to be uh, someone who set up the, depending on the tool, like cubes yeah, exactly. or, or, cubes. or a data warehouse, right? So. R shapes, all these kind of uh, star shape, cubes, rollups, but you had to you had to actually be in a, a, a true, almost a DBA, I would say, to be able to actually translate the the wishes of the analysts into into code. And tab uh, and Tableau was great because basically you as an analyst could point it to your spreadsheet, for example. Yeah. Or your access yeah. database, uh, which was. You know, back then, access databases were all over the place. Yeah. Um, and then there was, I don't know if you remember, there was another tool uh, that was that's older than Tableau, but actually also became kind of uh, popular around the time of Tableau called Click. Yeah, it's still, it's still, yeah. I mean, Tableau and Click are probably the two main uh, players, uh, two of the main players, I would say. It's Microsoft BI as well. Um, but they're the early ones that really pushed it uh, to the new limits. Right, right. The nice thing about Tableau is you could do this pivot, pivoting and uh, cross tabs, but visually. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, I think that in the early days, it wasn't really, Tableau wasn't really meant for big data in the sense of Hadoop scale, big data. But then there was actually yeah. another generation of startups that became BI tools for that uh, size of data, but uh, I don't know if any of them actually uh, uh, ended up becoming standalone companies, right? So Tableau and Click definitely are the ones that uh, survived. Uh, well, I mean, you have later ones like Looker that came later. Uh, oh yeah, that's much later. That's, e that's even after the generation yeah. that pointed to Tableau. Sisense, yeah. so. uh, I guess, also yeah, si around yeah. the time of Looker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah they, they were built with scale in mind. Sisense was, uh, was really kind of amazing uh, technology. It was using uh, CPU caching, right? Yeah. I still are, right? I mean, they, they still, they're doing well, thriving. Super, super fast. Uh, that was, uh, so that's why it's built for scale. Uh, much right. more than uh, right, existing right, right. tools at that time. 
So one I don't of the remember, I don't remember anybody else other than Tableau and Click that was really good for scale. I guess maybe they don't exist, but uh, or, or I just well, there wasn't were familiar. there were a bunch of uh, BI tools that ended up uh, pointing to Hadoop itself and maybe mm. using even Hadoop as the execution agent, e execution engine. Right. But like I said, uh, uh, none of them really uh, ended up uh, as standalone companies, right? But one of the reasons I wanted to have you today is because I wanted to talk to you about uh, what seems to be a kind of... A, uh, really uh, uh, another golden age for tools for analysts, right? So, um, yeah. and so I think there's a few reasons why people are interested in, in uh, BI tools and analyst tools. Again, one is again, uh, data uh, keeps growing, not just in size, but also in data in uh, the uh, source systems, right? So, yeah. Um, I mean, uh, you, you can be a company, even a small startup, and suddenly overnight, within six months, you're using so many different services. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. Uh, and so if you want to just on your marketing, the marketing aspect of your company, there's so many uh, data sources, right? So how do you make yeah. sense of all of these if you're an analyst, right? So, right. Um, and yeah, right. It's just marketing. If you think about it, right. You have, uh, first of all, you have different platforms that you advertise on. Each one generates its own data. Uh, and before it used to be much simpler. You, digital, you probably had just one and then the rest of it. I mean, there was no real data for newspaper advertising, radio advertising, television advertising. I mean, there was some, but it was very, not, not, not a big deal. Now you've got so many different platforms you can advertise on. Just that generates different sources uh, of data. Yeah, and I think and, it's not just it's not just the sources. It's also the type of data. In some places, you get text. You could get audio. In other places, you can get video. In other places, numbers, metrics. I mean, you've got you've got now a variety of sources of data that all are relevant for for some of the. Not for every company, but in a lot of companies, all are relevant for the job of the BI analyst. So the one of the hot topics in this area actually is this notion of a customer data platform, which is basically a 360 degree view of of your user or customers. Um, right. But that requires some sort of uh, data fusion that capability. So another so a related hot area in, when it comes to these topics is our data pipelines. Yeah, um, lots of companies around that. Yeah, a lot, lot of companies around that. So it's not just building the pipelines, but monitoring and making sure they're uh, uh, working well. Because uh, as more and more of your uh, dashboards depend on these pipelines, you want to make sure they're, these pipelines are healthy. Yeah. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, the end goal of all companies is to uh, derive insights, right? So yeah. how quickly can I get to insights and how, uh, how rich are these insights going to be? So before it was mostly reports, right? So right. here's what happened in the past. And those are still important actually. Uh, really? Even, e even yeah. now, because basically uh, you can imagine, even if you had access to Tableau uh, uh, era, if you're an analyst and someone tells you, tell me what's going on with this KPI, uh, and then you go to the uh, to your data warehouse or data lake or whatever, and then you realize, oh, now I have to wade through 500 different dimensions or variables, right? Right. Um, so I think uh, some of the innovations that we're going to talk about have to do with just kind of uh, increasing the productivity of analysts. Yeah. Um, so so um, let's look at some of the trends here. So the first one that I want to highlight is automation. So, it, so automation obviously is impacting every kind of job role. So including the role of the analyst. Um, 
So there are many. So there are many aspects of an analyst job that you can automate. So anything that stands out to you? Um, I think that the 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 easiest places for automation in the in that regard is um, in the first automation is in finding. The, the simple insights, right? Automating the simple insights that would be repetitive, that will be done over and over again. Uh, and those typically would be the simpler insights uh, where, you know, it's a query that you can somehow code either through an algorithm or uh, through an automation script uh, that will always produce the same type of insight. Uh, it but, could but, be, now, uh, but now, uh, but now, you're going to make this automation capability something that the analysts can set up, right? Yes. Yeah, I think the uh, the best people to set it up are the analysts themselves because it's going to free their time to do more complicated insights, the things that are uh, beyond it. I mean, even even in the things that. Uh, just think about where you, the analyst needs to provide some uh, guidance saying that everything is okay with a certain part of the business. I don't know, we're on track to our expected number of new users this week or this day or this month. Say that, that today an analyst with a manual thing would go and look at that KPI. He knows where the expected value is and he would say, yeah, we're on track. Uh, or um, even if he doesn't know where it, the expected is, he can guess what their expected is based on historical behavior and say, oh, this is now anomalous. It doesn't look like my expectation. Uh, now, this task can be automated quite easily with algorithms, uh, for example, using I see. So, like so anomaly you, detection. So what you're describing is more than just, because uh, uh, for a long time, these BI tools have had the, uh, uh, feature that the uh, analysts can schedule a report. So yeah, what you're I'm saying, not, I'm, yeah, I'm yeah. saying a little bit more than that. The insights, okay. not just the report itself. I think I'm taking as a given that automating creation of reports, automating uh, you know ETL processes, this is already there. Um, there are so I'm, I'm thinking more along the insights of where. Uh, where they can get automation around the type of insights that they were potentially doing manually and now can be done automatically. Uh, and, and the simplest insights are, you know, the ones that saying we are on track or we're not on track to compare to what we think the expectation should be. Uh, now, this, this is what we think the expectation to be is to be is an algorithm uh, can be done with an algorithm and then saying you're not following the expected path, that's, that's a test on that algorithm. And that's, so then, uh, 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 those can be automated now. So, so I, guess, uh, I guess the question is, so we're beginning then to see tools that, because uh, what you're describing in many ways is kind of, you're starting to get into the things that a data scientist normally would do, right? So we just, Basically, an analyst may not have the background in statistics to 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 discern that hey, this is beyond uh, this is a uh, this is outside the realm of normal. Yeah, I think that a lot of analysts do it do it all the time. Uh, you know, even visually, when you look at a chart at a graph over time, you your your brain is well well accustomed to seeing that something is abnormal, if you look at it. Uh, and a lot of analysts I've seen do create these uh, simple statistical rules. And, and, and those, a lot of times, they work OK as, uh, as, as, as simple statistic, statistics, like linear regression, basically creating a trend line and seeing the expectation based on the trend line. Uh, so they do that manually. That task can be automated and can be done even more accurate if you add some algorithms that are even more sophisticated. But even automating the creation of the trend line and checking against the trend line, that's something that today an analyst does all the time. By the uh, way, so, so Ira, so why so if you're going to, if, if you have a tool that allows you to highlight some of these uh, unusual behaviors, uh, then you might as well set, 
set up alerts, right? Yeah, exactly. And the so, alerts are the automations, basically. Yeah, yeah. So then, uh, so then now you're getting from uh, you're going from reports to monitoring. Yes. So the, the reports are, are always good because they tell you everything. Uh, they they give you a sense of uh, um, well, you use the reports for making potentially making decisions going forward. You're not you're not you you should, you're not using the reports anymore for monitoring, uh, and sometimes they are abused. I think reports that they are used as monitoring are kind of a failure of monitoring because uh, they're, they come very late. Uh, so you, you're monitoring something with a report. It means you're, you're waiting for the report to regenerate it, and that could be already too late. So the alerts replace the task of, uh, of discovering in the reports that something is off, but the reports are still useful because you want to make decisions going forward. You want to see what actually happened. Uh, and, th and the reports usually give you those kind of insights, telling you exactly what happened so you can make decisions going forward. Oh, I see that uh, you know, our sales grew by 20%. I can make a decision now to hire more people. Uh, so I need the report for that. Even that, if that 20% was not alerted on because it was okay, that was the right thing to happen. Um, so so it, separates, it separates the task of reporting for decision-making and, and monitoring. And I think that's important to separate. So a typical analyst, let's say uh, you're assigned to a certain business unit with a KPI, mm -hmm. right? So uh, like I said, so you can imagine now with so many uh, different data sources and, and, and just systems that people are working with and interacting with, uh, you might find yourself uh, having to understand so many different variables and dimensions that affect your, your KPI, right? So right. Uh, yeah. now we're starting to see tools that automate some of that, right? So CSU data. Yeah, I was going to one of them. Yeah, say CSU. And, then, and I think this is, this is a place of automation in the pipeline. Perhaps. So, so this is where basically, here's my KPI, tell me uh, what are the key drivers? Yes. And, and so here, bef the traditional BI tool would be very tedious to get very the report. And, and then it's not even clear that you won't miss something, right? And, and it's, yeah, definitely not. And it also, you might miss combinations of variables that impact because, you know, the, the manual way is to try manually different things and look at it and see, but it's very, it's, I mean, we can't, our brain cannot, cannot process probably more than two, three dimensions at a time. And uh, you know, it would be very hard to even manually do it. Uh, and in some cases, you might have a combination of variables that would create the impact. Uh, and it's not a, any one single one by itself. So things like uh, CISO data or other types of uh, uh, pre-processing steps or basically variable discovery from an entire data set, it not only automates the job of the analyst, but actually I think enhances it, makes it even, uh, makes those, in, makes whatever it discovers potentially even, even stronger. So, so I think we're getting close to something that I've long wanted, which is basically, you know, um, sometimes the problem with dashboards is, uh, it's like watching paint dry, unless there's, yeah. unless there's a big event Right, so like an anomaly or something. Yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, now, now because there's so many things that you should be watching, I've always longed for technology which will just display the right dashboard for me today. Yeah. Right, because basically, uh, uh, if there's nothing anomalous happening, surely there's still some things that uh, are more important than others. Um, yeah. And I think we're, we're probably getting to the point where this technology can easily do that, right? So... Draw me the charts that... Absolutely. That are the most interesting yeah. today, right? Yeah, I think, I, I think the hard part is deciding what is the most interesting uh, for a particular analyst in their particular role, automating that task of understanding what's more interesting to this analyst in this group versus another analyst 
potentially in another group or even in the same group uh, because they might be kind of responsible for slightly different things. But once the scope of the sphere of, of, of interest is defined, and that probably has to be some sort of a manual setup uh, because how would you, how would the system know? Once that is done, oh, so, so what you're, what you're, so, but basically what you're describing is, uh, uh, tell me, tell me the metrics upon which I should decide what to display. Yeah. But it could be a very large number, right? Uh, for yeah. example, if I'm, uh, if I'm an analyst in a gaming company and my company has 20 games, right? Uh, and I'm in charge of an analysis of one game. I can say I want my dashboard to reflect what's happening, the interesting things for that game, not for the other games, because I, I'm not in charge of that. So that, not, that piece of knowledge, I think we will, we will always have to get as an input. And once that is input, the systems can say, okay, I, I know all the data that relates to this game, all the variables that relate to these games, this particular game, now I can start uh, deciding what's interesting uh, for to show the analyst today. Uh, what would be the most interesting today for the analyst to see? And yeah, which is, uh, which, I mean, actually, uh, mo many of these, all these technologies, I think of as augmentation technologies rather yeah. than complete automation, right? So exactly. you still, so the, the, the great thing about analysts is they know, uh, the line of business or the domain really well. Yeah, and uh, the tool does not. But the tool can pour, can basically go and discover through the entire data what for that domain is interesting. Based on based on you telling the tool how to make that decision. So so it's uh, you know if before the way I think of an analyst, their task is to ask a question and they get an answer. Right, and the, and the tools are becoming more better and better at just answering lots of questions automatically. Right, you, know, you might have two thousand questions you want to ask, so the tools, because of the automation and, so, and a lot of the AI that is being put in them, can go and say, "I have answers to two thousand questions. Now let me show you the most interesting answers today." Because let's say if I have the same answer as I showed you yesterday or the day before, it's not interesting to show you the same piece of information again. Um, so I, that's the way I think of it. That's the that's the that's the big shift that I see that's coming with AI from a platform that you continuously you, you ask a question, it does all the processing, it gives you the answer, and you have to give all the parameters of the question. Well, that's okay. It comes to a system that can now ask itself constantly lots of action, lots of questions, or a much larger question, set of questions than you even thought about, and, and, and then decide which answers to start showing you. Uh, and of course, you can guide it along the way, but it, the, the, the starting point is here are 2,000 answers. Which answers do you want to get now? Instead of Ask me a question, I'll give you an answer. And and I think the other the other uh, shift is the types of questions you can ask, right? So I think um, we've we've over the years we've had a steady t progress towards expanding what analysts can do. Yep. First towards uh, uh, some statistical analysis, then some machine learning, right? Um, and you know you. I can think of a, f a few tools, right? So uh, many of them use kind of this uh, uh, workflow user interface kind of tool where you connect. Yeah. So this particular box will do some pre-processing of the data. Then yeah. I connect it to this box, will will do some summary statistics. Then yeah. this box will do some cluster analysis, right? So uh, yeah, so you have tools like Alteryx, Rapid Miner, Canine. Yeah, yeah. But recently, uh, there's a startup that came out of MIT uh, that actually we featured in conferences that I chaired in 2019. Uh, the startup is called Einblick, uh, but they use this kind of interesting visual data computing um, interface where if you had like a, 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 
a large Microsoft Surface, you can imagine having a group of people standing around the Surface in, in brainstorming. Generating really complicated answers, answers to very, very complicated questions. Yeah, so then- Creating, it, making it e very easy to ask a complicated question. Right, right, right. So then it does kind of the BI things you need is around pivoting, it does, the machine learning things that you see in some of these other analyst tools. Mm -hmm. But it's also starting to get into some things that are, uh, I think, underrated as far as machine learning and data science people. And this is in the area of simulations and what if, what if scenarios, right? So it's starting to get into, it's starting to add capability into that. So you can imagine, you can imagine, Ira, if you're an analyst and you're able to run uh, what if scenarios or some basic simulations that 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 could be useful I think it's uh, it's more than useful so I, I don't see it as underrated by machine learning people and data scientists so at least not by me I don't know about others I think well, you it's think just, of, you think it's of, just uh, one, I think one of, of the harder things to do yeah yeah I think um, of I think of machine learning people as doing classic tasks like clustering classification I guess regression. Yeah, but that's because it's easier. <laughs> it's not because the problem of what if is it's because it's a harder task to to, to crack. Um, yeah, and also because and also, because it, also, it requires it requires your it requires an ability to basically query your your model uh, with different inputs, simulation, right? Doing simulations, and that's. Um, it's kind of the next level of a lot of these models to be able to either run simulations or produce what if. And for every type of model, you have to generate a technique that will do it accurately. Uh, and, and I think it's still not a, not a well-solved problem in machine learning. That's why it, any company that uh, comes out with these kind of capabilities has a really good advantage. Um, yeah, it, also, it also, you know, someone who worked in finance a little bit, mm -hmm. uh, it's actually, you know, you just also have to be careful, right? Because basically uh, uh, the past is not representative of the future, number one. And then, and then secondly, just building a realistic simulation. Uh, it's really tough. It's really tough. So even if you have such a tool, you have to really kind of make sure your management understands that uh, uh, the limitations of what you're presenting them, right? Any, anything that you do for, for forecasting the future has to always come with a big asterisk saying, uh, this is, you know, forecast is meant for fools. Uh, but but uh, we are forecasting so, so, yeah. what we're forecasting anyway. <laughs> but this is coming from someone like yourself, who's now starting to build forecasting tools, right? Well, so, we, have so, a pro we have a forecasting tool, and it's uh, and, and 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 like you said, it, yeah. it, it's it it work. You you can get good, accurate forecasts most of the time, uh, but you always have to keep in mind that you know there are so many things that can change the forecast. It could be a singular event, you know an extreme one we just saw in 2020, right? Um, COVID completely threw off all the forecasts. Whatever you did before probably changed uh, in dramatic ways. Uh, and it could be, you know, it could be because uh, sometimes your forecasts can actually, whatever you forecast can actually influence the future. So if you're running a what if scenario, you're doing a forecast and you're running a what if scenario, now you're taking action based on that, your action influences the forecast. Um, and it can influence it in, uh, in ways that you have not anticipated because you don't, you don't have, we're not God. So we don't know, we don't know all the potential variables that can influence everything. Uh, so and, what do uh, you, so how do you when you when you uh, onboard someone in your forecasting tool who's mm -hmm. an analyst, how do you how do you uh, present the caveat? So, in other words, when they start presenting this to their management, how yep. how do you train them to do that? So, so what we found is that what they really want uh, a lot of times are models, uh, are forecasts, and explanation on the forecast. So, because this is the way everybody works today as well. I mean, even if you do it manually or do it through a model, 
um, you show, you come to your management and you say, my forecast for next year, for six months from now is going to be a growth of 20%. The manager, the next thing he's going to ask is, why do you think that? What makes you, what made you come to that conclusion? Uh, and without that, nobody trusts any forecasts like for, for, for decision making, or I wouldn't say nobody, but I would say it, it's, it's a harder it's harder work for the analysts to, um, to, to sell their forecast if they can't explain the reasons for the forecast. And it's the same if they use their own technique, whatever they did manually, or uh, an AI system or machine learning algorithm that produced the forecast. So if I can use the best algorithm in the world that I can show on the history has 99% accuracy, if I, and now I tell you the forecast for next year, in most cases, they'll still come back and say, please tell me why. So whatever forecasting technique you use has to have an ability to explain itself, uh, to explain at least what made you forecast a certain number. Well, I forecast that it's 20% in six months because we have uh, a version release coming up in three months. And we've seen in the past that the version release increases our uh, number of users by 5% and that gets translated to this and that gets translated to that. Now you could be wrong, obviously, because something could happen that you did not expect. But um, do you? Uh, but at least it's being accepted. And without it, we saw that it's very hard to just give a forecast. Do you find era? Maybe maybe this becomes too complicated to present uh, to management. Uh, do you find it useful to say that uh, here's our forecast? It has the following error bar. It's not enough. It's useful. It's useful. It's very useful. It's important too. No, but the, by that, itself, is that, yeah. do, you, do you find that that's a that's a requirement that you should say? Actually, surprisingly, not from everybody. Really, surprisingly, surprisingly. I mean, they want uh, a point point estimate, point forecast. Yeah, people want simple explanations and simple, simple, simple things, right? When you tell them, oh, it could be from here to here, it's already... But, you know, I mean, you, you look at any time series forecasting tool, uh, the further you uh, uh, the get, the from, get from you the present, present, the wider the error bar is, right? Yeah. Um, true. It's, um, so you're, it's say, still... you're saying the explanation is more of a requirement. It's more of a requirement, yeah. Um, they kind of, the, the error bars are kind of to see, to get a sense of, okay, you know, the fluctuate, the potential fluctuation, but it's still not enough. You still, they you still want to know, they still want to know why. And by the way, this why is, is, uh, is kind of the, when you, when you achieve the ability to say why a forecast was a certain way, it's halfway or even more than halfway to the what if uh, analysis. Because if you're, if you're able to say, okay, these are the drivers of this particular forecast, now you can play around with the drivers uh, using some sort of a simulation, even simple simulation, and see the outcome of that. And as long as you believe the accuracy of your forecast is, is fairly, it doesn't change based on the simulation, then, then it's, it's a, that's the way to, that's one way of doing what if. Uh, so, so but still, even if you do what if, still somebody would want to know uh, why you made that. What, what are the drivers? So we just, we just kind, of, uh, uh, kind of established that these, the, the tools for analysts these days, you know, so BI tools and other tools, uh, now allow the following, right? So it allows the analyst to weigh through larger data sets with more, mm -hmm. with more variables. Yes. Uh, it enables them to do some uh, advanced analytics, even machine learning, maybe yep. even simulations and what if scenarios. We're starting uh, to see that, yeah. We're starting to see that, right? So, mm -hmm. and then uh, obviously analysts uh, uh, comes to the table, hopefully with some context, domain knowledge, uh, and subject matter expertise, right? Exactly. exactly. So then now we're getting to the point then, Ira, that an analyst can do more and more of what a traditional data scientist five years ago 
What's doing? Sure. Um, but I think it will go to two directions. If, if uh, I think some of them will do that. And I think others will actually look for, um, I would say, more potential data sources or more potential, I would call it, transformations of the data sources. Um, the da who, who, who's doing that, the data scientist? The, the, analy the analyst will start doing, some analysts will start doing that. Okay. So for example, think about a data source that could be um, um, one data source that could be, let's say your Twitter feed, right? You, so you have your Twitter feed of your company Twitter or all the mentions of your company. One simple transformation that a lot are doing anyways today is to transform that into a sentiment analysis, right? So I have a, I have a data stream of text and now I get out of this data stream of text mentioning my company I get sentiments about my company. Now, sentiment analysis, they don't have to invent sentiment analysis. Google has a, has a, Google machine learning has an API where you can send your, you know, whatever text you want, you get back sentiment results. Other companies are also doing that. So I think a lot of the work of some of the analysts would be in determining what are the right sources of data and transformations on those data that will help us uh, get more variables, more interesting variables for you know, the, it, it's, new insights. It's interesting. And, and then some will do the, the insights themselves, the data science behind the insights. Interesting you're pointing that out because a good friend of mine who was up until recently the head of uh, data science and data engineering at Rakuten, they mm -hmm. actually had a, a role uh, which they internally, the title was data wrangler. And data it, wrangler. It wasn't. It wasn't. A, it was more of an analyst background. Mm -hmm. And so the data wrangler had two jobs. One was uh, something similar to what you said, but the other side of their job was uh, QAing models. So basically, mm -hmm. once the model is built, they 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 have some kind of QA process, and then the data wrangler uh, was responsible for that. So what they found is that. Uh, it was actually a great way to uh, uh, retain people because then you, some of them became interested in becoming data scientists. So then they could, they could train them further along and then mm -hmm. and, until they became data scientists. So, and in fact, they had, uh, he was telling me they had quite a few of these data wranglers who uh, upskilled and became data scientists. Interesting. Yeah, it makes, makes a lot of sense. Uh, if you know how to do a model QA, you're halfway, right? So, um, um, so then, uh, so you've got, you've got, uh, so by the way, so what you just brought up there, the, the Twitter feed, in many ways, is actually kind of advanced because when I, uh, uh, in our conversation, in the back of my mind, everything that I'm thinking of is structured data. Yeah, right? so a lot of it is unstructured. Because, yeah. no, no, structured. No, I mean, a lot of the new data yeah, a that lot is of coming data, yeah. to BI but, is unstructured. But the traditional analyst is mostly structured data, right? Uh, true. I think that it's always about normalization, right? So you have this unstructured data that you want to normalize into structured data and deciding what kind of normalization you want to do that will help you later on deciding what are the sources and how to achieve it. This, this is, you know, this will be those data wranglers, I guess, or uh, it will be that, you know, some of the analysts will become, uh, do, will do a lot of that because it's very hard. Uh, I mean, even CISU data, right? They know how to take data, data warehouse, go through lots and lots of variables and discover dependencies and a lot of interesting insights and create those answers uh, or create the, the mechanism that, those answers, complicated answers can be achieved, but they rely on the data there. They don't know the data they don't know. Uh, and now who will bring the additional data? It will be those analysts or those data wranglers that understand that domain, understand what could potentially help, uh, and then go and seek those data sources but they may not and normalize them and normalize them. But uh, yeah. they may not have the skills to actually uh, bring the data on board, right? Because they, they don't code. 
No, so they, they they won't do necessarily the coding themselves, but the, you know they they will they'll be the ones that will say this is the source we need. This is weather data. We need the weather data. Why do we need it? Because it's going to help us with uh, problem X Y. It's going to help us forecast uh, product sales. Uh, and then they will find a source and then maybe they will involve somebody who develops and, and connects to the API of the source or whatever it is, just makes the connection. Uh, but they will do the spec. They will decide what's needed and how it's needed and whether it has to be transformed in a certain way and search for the tools that maybe do the transformation. And, and there are more and more open tools that can be used uh, for so many types of transformations. And the, uh, so it's, it will either be inside the BI tools and some BI tools will probably build more and more of these uh, as built in. But even before that, they will involve the IT or some development tasks to, to do that. But the, the IT or the developers will not know what to do unless they are being given the task. Mm -hmm. So if before, if you go back to your story like uh, of, of early days of BI, you went to the IT to, to run your reports, to create the code that will run your report, now you'll go to IT, not for that, but for uh, connecting, getting the data, the raw data that will later on generates all these insights and reports. So it's kind of uh... which is why uh, which is why the other renaissance, as we discussed earlier, is in these data engineering tools. Exactly. So, so data pipelines, lake houses, metadata Where, yeah. metadata management tools. Exactly. Exactly. Um, it's not just about your internal data and your simple structure data. Well, simple in parentheses, right? Your structured data that's within the company. You're you're connecting to a lot of different external services. And, and data sources that come from lots of different places. By the way, our listeners may wonder, so why do two people who are interested in machine learning, why are they so interested in analyst tools? And I have one simple answer to that era, which is basically numerous, stu numerous studies have shown that the companies who actually succeed in AI and ML are the ones who, who uh, build upon existing uh, data systems yeah. uh, mainly for bi so they take their the systems they have for bi and they start layering ml and mm -hmm. that's how they encounter their initial success story and then they build upon it yeah i uh, totally i can very much relate to that to that because i think some of the things that we've built are you know, designed for analysts designed to solve certain types of insights that they need especially around more of the monitoring the day-to-day -day monitoring and uh, it's definitely easier for us. It was easier for us to to start with that segment, see that it's working, and expand to others. Uh, so the other the other interesting topic here, which is a bit science sci-fi, a little bit, is UX, right? So traditional UX is charts, then interactive charts, mm -hmm. uh, visual pivoting. Now you have Einblick, which has kind of the the Microsoft service touch screen, which, which you can also use in a, a browser. It's almost like the movie Minority Report. Right? Yeah, I remember. Um, yeah. And then uh, a few years ago, I, I actually commissioned for one of our Strata Data conferences, someone build a, a kind of a demo of, uh, of basically BI for, with VR virtual reality, mm. uh, which was interesting because then you could go in, you know, put one of these headsets on and then really travel around. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, I wonder, I mean, I think that might, you know who the the audience for that might be? Are traders. If, if unless, That's true. unless traders completely get automated away by uh, machines, right? Which is happening now with high frequency trading. But maybe there's the Definitely. class of financial analysts and global macro traders who are uh, need to wade through a lot of data, but are not, you know, their, their holding period for their trades are longer than mere seconds. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I think the... I think that the visualization part, let's say I, it's a point where I'm the 
weakest. Yeah. My, my visual capabilities of seeing things, uh, that's why I like math more than, uh, than visualization because math is just equations. I kind of see things through the equations. I, I find but you it can't present, you can't things. You can't present math to management. Ex well, yeah, exactly. So yeah. it has to come with, with really nice visual, really good way of visualization. The only disadvantage is that we're kind of limited by our 3D uh, mm -hmm. world uh, and the way we, I mean, it's very hard for people to create visualizations that are higher than 3D. Yeah. Um, uh, honest, still have honest, make sense. Honestly, even 3D is awkward because the, the <laughs> computer is 2D. Exactly. Uh, uh, well, if you do the VR, then yeah. you can start putting things in space. Right. Um, but still, trying to put charts in three, even trying to put charts in three D. Anyway, whoever cracks this in, uh, basically has to ha has to have really interesting ways of, of abstracting high dimensional data. It's one of these things. Three dimensional it, space. It's one of these things. I suspect will. I don't know what the time frame is. Will become more mainstream. <laughs> At some point, yeah, and it, you know, the thing is, I'm my brain is so limited in terms of visualization, I can't even imagine how it would look like. By the um, way, uh, Ira, so as we add more capabilities to these analyst tools, which means uh, analysts are now being augmented by ML, can do mm -hmm. ML, can do simulations, and things like this. Uh, at some point. Analysts will have the same problem that data scientists and data engineers have, have long grappled with, which is reproducibility in lineage, right? So basically, you know, you do an analysis using one of these tools that gives you advanced capabilities as an yeah. analyst. And then six months later, your manager asks you, hey, uh, Ira, How remember, you that? remember that thing? How did you get that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So actually, the nice thing, at least in data science, in the last few years, there are quite a few companies that were starting to build kind of this for uh, for, for data for science for data, for data science. science. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, it hasn't been around for so I, I even in the last three years. There's a company that just got acquired, an Israeli company, just got acquired by I think acquired uh, Dell, Converge.io. Uh, basic, but there are a few others that created platforms for data but, scientists uh, e e even the for storing that, things. Even the stuff that we discuss, Einblick, right? Yeah, even you're, that. You're you're interacting with five people in a Microsoft Surface. Yeah. And then two weeks later, I guess you it has to be saved. Uh, I saved, guess saved, Einblick saved. lets you annotate, and maybe the Einblick thing can. Uh, uh, has enough documentation capability, but uh, uh, there might be a need to in actually, uh, after the fact, introduce something similar to what those workflow UXs have, right? So, exactly. Which is also, ha they also have their limitations because uh, you just have your boxes. The nice thing about Einblick is you get lost in the analysis, right? So, yeah. 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 So, I mean, so I, here I, guess, I, the, I guess you the, have to snapshot every time you have to snapshot what you did. Yeah. The complicated part is that it's not just the boxes and what you set up. It's not the abstraction, but it also has to snapshot the data behind it uh, and the visualizations behind it. And I think the data behind it is, you know, you have to snapshot. Otherwise, you won't get the same results. Uh, so that could produce huge amounts of extra data. Um, and, 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 and when you're doing all these simulations and what if scenarios, right? So uh, what if you're just basically, uh, what do you call it? Data snooping, or maybe it's just a Bonferroni kind of a problem, right? So the more you test, the more likely you'll find something you like. <laughs> and that's, that's true for machine learning algorithms as well. That's the, right, the right. But, you... uh, but maybe the analysts need better guidance because they, they don't have that uh, level of training, right? That's true. I mean, even in machine learning, I think when you try, uh, when you try out more and more, even if you split your data into a training set and test it, right? But now you want to find the best algorithm that you could use, but you use for all the algorithm the same training set and test set and then choose based on that, you're basically overfitting to your test set. Um, so it's just like the analyst uh, trying out, the more they try on the same 
data, the more conjectures, the more likely they are to, to get that, uh, uh, that scenario as well. Yeah, there are areas of machine, uh, machine learning, particularly in NLP, where they're realizing that, hey, we need to inject some kind of rigor yeah. Some some t some ideas from software engineering, right? So how do we build unit testing and and, exactly. uh, and uh, robustness into our models? Um, so one uh, one uh, last question, which is basically uh, monitoring versus reporting. Mm -hmm. uh, are we going to see them merge? Um, and, or for and for our listeners, make a dis make a one cent a very quick distinction between the two. Yeah, so monitoring is basically observing what is happening now, so you can you can be you can react to it immediately as quickly as possible. Reporting is something that you do on a schedule. Uh, so I produce a report once a day, could be once an hour, once a week, once every quarter, uh, and it's it's more of a static snapshot of the time that that it was happening. The, different, the main difference is usually a report is consumed after the fact. Uh, so it gets generated and consumed sometimes after the fact. Nobody rushes to see the report immediately so we can react. If they do that, then it's basically monitoring. But why do, why do I need two tools? Can, can, I, um, can so, I just so I merge? Think can, can I just... Will all these, will these tools merge? They're based on the same data, so there's no reason why they shouldn't merge and be one tool that can give you a report when you require it for a certain... So monitoring is to tell you everything's on track, and if something's not on track, react to it now. A report is, it's not just to, to show you what happened, but to show you what happened so you can make decisions going forward. Uh, and and uh, and then you you don't want to see just the things that are abnormal right now, but you want to see everything everything that is normal, so you can make decisions. Uh, so that's so it's all, but it's based on the same data, and there is no reason why not to merge the two uh, into the same tool if that's available. So one, I forgot one last question for sure, mm -hmm. which is basically <laughs> a few years ago I had you develop a class which was machine learning for product managers. Right. Uh, and we just spent the hour talking about uh, the next generation of analyst tools. So if you were to teach a class for analysts, uh, aimed at analysts, so... Machine learning for analysts. Or, or just... A, or, or, or an, so you're an analyst now. Mm -hmm. This is the landscape of tools. You know, there are more things for you to do. So what are some yeah. of the key topics that you would... Uh, each an analyst, analyst these days. Um, I'm get so again. I think because the analyst role is going to get split, you know, there will be the ones that will talk about the pipelines uh, and what do, what can you do as an analyst for the pipelines, and there will be the ones that will talk about the insights what if kind of generating the output of the data. So for the one, but the, I think that a lot of, for the ones that are supposed to generate the insights, uh, go learn some of the, you know, what are the capabilities of machine learning algorithms so you can leverage them. You don't have to know how to code them. You don't have to develop new algorithms, but you can go and take them as building blocks for you to use. And if you understand their limitations, their inputs, outputs, uh, how it's how you can use them, you can get you can be a very good an because an analyst is is will be basically evaluated based on how well his insights, did the insights that they bring, produce positive impact on the business. Uh, or avoided pitfalls in the business. So, and so that will be that half. The second half, the ones that will work with generating, you know, more data for the organizations, there I would go and say, go learn uh, both what are potential sources that can be done based on the type of analyst you're going to be, if it's for marketing, if it's for other types of scenarios, what are all the data sources? And you will be, you will be hailed <laughs> as a hero if, if you bring the sources that will later just give the, the best insights possible. So data sources, which would be domain specific, 
so yep. things that the things that your industry uses but you might also end up discovering new ones that new uh, ones yeah the rest that of will your, give an advantage the rest exactly. of your industry don't take for granted right yeah, or don't have, or don't, didn't think about, or uh, will give you an advantage. I mean, pricing. If you can get a source that tells you the pricing pricing of competitors, right? That's that's a, that's an amazing source. So, do you um, think these two types of analysts, as you describe, internally, they're both considered analysts? Would, would you know? So they would they would. Uh, so let's say uh, the marketing department may have these two types of analysts. I think so, and maybe the, maybe the one the data the data analyst will be called a wrangler, like you mentioned, mm -hmm. and uh, maybe that the name will change. The the analyst that does the insights, I think it's very similar to what's expected from an analyst today. So that's probably would be the analyst 2.0, 3.0. So what makes you so what what led to your thinking that that, that there will be these two types of analysts? So are you starting to see that in your customers? Um, you're starting to see it and it's also, you know, it's a two, two, I mean, it's almost like two ways of thinking a little bit. Um, I see. Um, that's so, so it's, I, I can't, you might have the same person being right for both, but it's probably too hard to do both things at the same time. I see. Um, that's, that's my opinion. And also you start seeing how data groups, BI, BI teams, you've got the people handling data inputs, ETLs, right? All the pipelines, making sure everything's flowing and you've got the people working on the insights and it's, you know, asking the same person to do both. It's possible, but then it, you know, it takes a long time. Each task takes a long time. All right. And with that, thank you, Ira. Thank you very much, Ben. Thank <music> you.